All right. Hello, friends, and welcome to our 156th online gathering that we call Courageous Leadership. My name is David Heidley, and I use pronouns like he and him. I'm part of the ELCA coaching support team, and I'll be your facilitator today. We're happy to have you join us, and I want to remind you that last week's session, along with dozens of other recordings, are archived uh, to view whenever you're ready at elcacoaching.org. Uh, Jill, our usual host, normally takes this time to do a land acknowledgement and to affirm ELCA Coaching's commitment to the truth and healing movement. But as I was preparing for this time today, I learned that many of the Indigenous people who are connected to the land where I serve and live have expressed concerns about land acknowledgments and have asked white people not to do them. So out of respect for their wishes, I'm going to do something a little different in this time. Part of healing is telling the truth about the past. And so I'll tell you a little bit about Monroe, Michigan, and how it's the home, the adopted home, of George Armstrong Custer. Custer was a cavalry commander during the American Civil War. He earned that commission in spite of coming in dead last in his class at West Point and earning 726 demerits during his time there, one of the worst records ever. However, a raging war demanded officers, and so he was sent to the field to command the Michigan Cavalry Brigade at the Battle of Gettysburg. But Custer is best known for leading the 7th Cavalry Regiment of the United States Army in the Battle of Little Bighorn, where he faced off against Lakota Sioux, Northern Cheyenne, and Arapaho warriors under the direction of Sitting Bull, Crazy Horse, and other war chiefs. Custer underestimated the size and capability of the forces he was facing. And that mistake would end up costing Custer his life and the life of more than 200 of his men. And in spite of his terrible track record at West Point and his humiliating defeat at Little Bighorn, in 1910, President William Howard Taft came to Monroe, Michigan and unveiled a 15-foot-tall bronze statue of Custer, celebrating his service to the nation. Since its unveiling, that statue has been moved twice, each time to a more prominent location than the last. As we gather here for Courageous Leadership, the work that we're trying to do is building a safer and braver space to acknowledge the truth of who we are and how we're doing. It's our hope that by doing that, we'll be taking intentional steps towards living into God's promised future. For our opening devotion today, I thought I'd share with you a verse that's been a part of my prayer practice over the last 10 days or so, and then follow it up with a reflection by Meta Herrick Carlson from the book, Speak It Plain. Our scripture comes from Psalm 31. Blessed be the Lord, for he has wondrously shown his steadfast love to me when I was beset as a city under siege. I said in my alarm, I'm driven far from your sight. But you heard my supplications when I cried out for help. Love the Lord, all you his saints. The Lord preserves the faithful, but abundantly repays the one who acts haughtily. <clears throat> Be strong and let your hearts take courage, all of you who wait on the Lord. This is a prayer for a time of political or civic grief. Tragedy has the power to shock your body into isolation, to hide you away and apart in deep grief or self-preservation while waiting for an undoing or a miracle. Your spirit has a magnetic pull. It can brave the fragments of your loneliness and fear always in search of others and wholeness. You are gathered by the Spirit, who teaches every spirit to move together with courage and empathy, even and especially today. This holy house called Sanctuary is a safe place for bodies and spirits, your despair and your hope, for loud lamentation, and for songs of praise. 
there must be enough room here for the minor melodies. The weeping, the sighs too deep for words, the fullness of tragedy, and all your fragments. Here we speak of hate and fear, the unruly powers of this world, where their destructive power and lies are woven through the human story. And here we speak of mercy and love, the audacity of God's grace that is balm in the cracks of our suffering, filling that space between us with a final word that is always life. I'm going to take a moment now and introduce you to Reverend Anna Gordy. She is an artist, writer, theologian, and parent serving as a mission developer for the ELCA in San Antonio, Texas. She's trained as an ELCA Segment 2 coach for mission development and congregational vitality, and they serve as a spiritual director for communities often underserved. And important for our conversation today, she's autistic. Anna believes that each of us are created in the shadow of the divine, and that spark of God's light resides in us all. She says we are each created to be artists and theologians, and they have devoted their life to helping uncover their creative place in God's world. Anna, welcome to this space. The floor is yours. Thank you. Um, yeah, I am in San Antonio, Texas, where we expect a high today of 83, and it feels just real unfair to most of us here. But I'd like to thank you very much for inviting me into this space where the warmth is of a different type. And I'm just grateful to have this opportunity to talk a little bit about um, the intersection of autism and faith. So a little bit more about me. Um, I was baptized into the Lutheran tradition into one of the ELCA predecessor bodies when I was three years old. I graduated with a bachelor's in theology when I was 22. I graduated from seminary with Brie when I was 40. Brie was not 40. I was formally diagnosed with autism when I was 45, but I have been, of course, autistic my entire life. Additionally, um, some of you know, but I have five children and all of them now have been diagnosed with autism or ADHD or both. My children have been allowed to choose their own faith adventures. And so in my family, we have a Jew, a few Christians, an atheist, an agnostic, and a Wiccan. My godson and my grandchildren are also neurodivergent and they are Muslim. And I tell you all of this so that you understand a little bit better the place that I metaphorically stand as I speak to you. And so that you understand this is something I have both lived experience with and experience living with. When you're diagnosed late in life, you spend some time looking backwards at all the years and all the events and things that happened with a new lens. And as I've done that work, I've paid particular attention to my life and experience in the church as a child, as a youth minister, as a parent, and now as a pastor. And it's clear for me that my faith and my autism are bound together because I am made in the image of God and a spark of God resides in me. And also before I was born, my brain was becoming autistic and you cannot separate any of those things. What a joy that is. So what is autism? I was not sure the folks who would be um, in this space, how much you would know. So if you already know this stuff, just ignore me for a few minutes. And if you don't, um, here's a, a condensed version <laughs> of what autism actually is. Uh, autism or autism spectrum disorder is classified as a neurological developmental disorder. And it affects approximately one in 54 children according to the CDC that number is rising. And it's not because of vaccines or because there's a larger percentage of people being born with autism, but because as a society, we're learning more about autism and therefore we're able to identify it more readily. Autism is considered a spectrum, not to be confused with a binary, right? People are not more or less autistic. We are or we aren't. The spectrum looks more like different constellations of symptoms from person to person. 
and they all tend to revolve around communication differences, around sensory issues or thought patterns, repetitive behaviors, and necessary uh, supports. There are today considered three levels of autism. There's level one requiring support, level two requiring substantial support, and level three requiring very substantial support. When we are diagnosed, we are assigned a level of support needs. But depending on the external stressors in our lives, we may need more or less support than the diagnostic shelf we get put on. I am a level one autistic person. And when things get extra hairy, I may require the support that a level two diagnosed, a diagnosed person may require. My daughter is a level two autistic person. When things are good and calm in her world, she needs the support that a typical level one autistic person may be required. So there's a lot of variation in autism itself and in the individuals themselves. And as we like to say, if you've met one autistic person, you've met one autistic person. Yes, most of us, we were talking about this um, before y'all joined, David and I were. Um, a lot of folks, there's a debate in the autistic community about whether we should use um, person first language. So say I'm a person with autism, or if we say I'm an autistic person. And what I'm learning is that tends to break down. It's not a hard and fast rule, of course, but it tends to break down along generational lines. So people who are my age and younger tend to prefer autistic person. People who are a little older than me tend to prefer it the other way. And I'm wondering how much of that is an internalized ableism kind of thing, because for so long we were taught that to be autistic was other, or not as valuable, or didn't have space at the table. And as I said before, it's literally the way our brains are constructed from before we we're born. So from my perspective, an autistic person is what I am. It's not something I have, it's just who I am. Also of note, for years, level one autistics were often diagnosed with Asperger's syndrome. But in 2013, the authors of the DSM-5, which is the diagnostic book that we use to talk about neurological and psychological issues, those authors discontinued this language because they wanted to avoid the misconception that Asperger's syndrome was a different condition from autism. And because Hans Asperger was a Nazi who collaborated in the mass murder of children with disabilities under the Third Reich. So we just don't wanna give him the floor anymore. And yes, it is sobering to look around the dinner table and realize that all of you would likely have died in the Holocaust. Also, much more fun to me, autistic folks are more likely than the general population to have LGBTQ plus identities. Some studies suggest that autistic per people assigned female at birth are three times more likely to be LGBTQ, and those assigned male at birth are four times more likely. Conversely, trans folks are three to six times, depending on your study, to be three to six times more likely to be autistic than cisgender people are. So for me, as someone who is both an LGBTQ person and an autistic person, it emphasizes again, the need for an ELCA and a reconciling in Christ witness, why that's so, so important. Because when you exclude queer folks, you're also excluding autistic folks. More familiar to most of you than the autism spectrum will be the idea of a faith spectrum, although you may not have used those words before. There's not one religion, of course, although most of us agree that there's one God, not all, but many. There's not one religion, there are literally thousands of them in the world, and faith is not a binary either. People aren't more, aren't having more or less faith than another, it's just different. There are thousands of different religions and there are different expressions within those religions. So you think for just a moment about the diversity within the American Christianity alone. Okay. But then think about families who are multi-faith, who celebrate each other's traditions, 
who accept and value the thinking and practice of their loved one's religions. For example, I'm a Christian clergy person, but my own faith practices are deeply rooted in Jewish tradition because of my long connection to Jewish communities and to Jewish individuals. So when the two spectrums, autism and faith, intersect, we see a metaphorical kaleidoscope of faith expression. There are as many expressions of faith as there are autistic people, each divinely made. Now, I believe in giving credit where credit is due. So just know that a lot of what I say next comes in part from the thinking of Samantha Stein. She is a level one autistic human born in the United Kingdom. She's of Lutheran and Jewish ancestry, I recently learned, so no wonder I love her so much. Very few folks are ambivalent about religion. We tend to be all in or completely out. The folks who kind of hang on the edges are there because they're not sure if they're welcome or because they're trying to make grandma happy. But typically, given the opportunity to be welcomed as they fully are, they're either all in or all out. Those of us who are atheistic have usually come to the conclusion that atheism is the right path because of logic or reasoning. And religious people tend to, exp to express our faith through metaphor, and that doesn't always resonate with typically linear, logical autistic thinkers. Autistic folks tend to see the holes in theology very early on. I think about all of the times that I've had to discuss evolution versus creation, for example, and how can both be true? To simplify it a little bit, there are two types of thinking. There's top-down thinking, which is quick thinking. Decisions are made based on small amounts of information and pre-existing knowledge. And bottom-up thinking, which is slower, it's more deliberate, and it looks at all the details in depth. Of course, all people use both kinds of thinking. However, autistics tend to favor bottom-up thinking, and we can get bogged down in the details. That's when we ask the rest of you to help us out. Since we are slower processors, it can take us longer to form a conclusion. And that kind of thinking leads a lot of autistic people to atheism. But it can also lead someone to be deeply believing with maybe just a nonconformist attitude towards religion. So even if this kind of thinker maintains a belief toward God, they tend to be more critical of the religion part of the faith life, the rules and constraints there. For example, we may remain Christian, but choose to practice in a non-conventional way. See also my own religious and spiritual practices. The appeal of religion for some autistic folks, though, is also undeniable. Religious practice is rooted in ritual and in routine, both things that we tend to love. Samantha cites authority-sanctioned stimming, saying that rosary beads are the original fidget toy. But if you think about our worship, all of our movements, like the sign of the cross, standing for the gospel, et cetera, and the ritualized prayers, the liturgies, the Lord's prayer, all of this can be deeply comforting to an autistic person. When life is chaotic, the liturgy is virtually guaranteed to be constant. Faith communities also provide autistic folks with a built-in script. No matter which community we find ourselves in, we almost always have understood parameters for conversation. This part I found super interesting. Historically, being in the clergy actually attracted many neurodivergent people. It likely suited them too. Historically, clergy were big thinkers and often the most well-educated folks in their communities. Many times they were the only ones who could read or write. Clergy were also a little bit isolated from their communities or a little bit separate. And I just keep thinking about how in seminary, we're still taught to do that, right? You can't have friends in your congregation because boundaries. Clergy were still connected though to community through various kinds of ways. Um, you think about um, inviting the vicar over for lunch or something like that. Um, and so being part of the clergy provided a good balance between introversion and peopling. Many re religious communities have mandatory silence um, or they greatly value it. 
and this reminds me of the great debate that we often have in congregations, which is whether or not folks should be allowed to talk during the prelude. Do you talk in the sanctuary or do you take it to the neurothex? Being clergy might have um, eliminated some social pressure also because you didn't have to have a conventional marriage, for example. You didn't have to have a conventional lifestyle or children. A larger proportion of the autistic community are asexual. So what better place to be than in the monastery or a convent? And I think about all those desert fathers and mothers. If you chose this kind of religious life, you'd be able to engage special interests like gardening, like cooking, like studying. You could be in silence for days at a time. And you'd be serving a community and all of that is meaningful work, which is very, very important to autistic people. In theory, being part of the clergy or an intentional part of a faith community in that way, it's a structure that probably suited a lot of autistic folks and provided certain benefits and protections. And many of my clergy friends are autistic also or are learning that they are neurodivergent in some way. So given all of this, what then is the goal of congregations and for our purposes specifically, the role of or the goal of Christian congregations? We do have to have conversations about who we're willing to invite and welcome and affirm. If it truly is our goal to gather all people then we have to intentionally make space for autistic people to join us. Well, how do we do that? That is an excellent question. And it's one I have some answers for, but since each autistic person is different, it's bound to be different in your community and your context. So I would invite you, if you have great ideas, to share them with one another. I look back at my, um, my life and my children's lives and I talked with some friends who were also raising autistic kids in the church. And we came up with a few things that seem like um, kind of a duh, but are actually deeply meaningful. Um, involve autistic folks in worship, particularly children, by giving them a job, even if it's a made up job. That way they have something to do they know what the parameters of their engagement are supposed to be, and they feel valued and caring for the community, which is particularly meaningful. One of my friends reminded me that her daughter, as a teenager, was welcomed into adult study because there were confirmation classes and then there was adult stuff. So this 15-year-old had no place to go. The child was welcomed into adult Sunday school, and then her opinions were sought and valued. And that really reinforced her position as, a body, as part of the body of Christ. The same kid was allowed to sing in the choir, the adult choir at age eight. And so these adults recognizing the passions and the interests of the child have encouraged this kid to continue to seek out um, worship opportunities as a young adult because church is a place where she is valued and cared for. There will inevitably be meltdowns for adults, I've had them, and for children. And I think that for us to just recognize that it will in fact happen, that it's a medical event and not a temper tantrum, not a tool of manipulation, but something that's uncontrollable is so important. And if we recognize that, then we are able to approach that person with compassion instead of kind of escalating um, the event. Another thing that seems to be very important is if, um, if autistic folks look like they're not engaged, if they are playing games or reading books or doodling in worship, some of us learned that an acceptable STEM was knitting, we can do that in worship. We may look like we're not engaged, but we are. So we respectfully invite you to stop making assumptions about engagement. 
And if you're truly concerned, you can always just ask us a question because I guarantee you, we want to tell you what we know, if it seems to be a safe space. There are other things to consider too in worship opportunities. Um, one of my children for years would absolutely um, freak out on Ash Wednesday because she doesn't like to be dirty, especially her face. And so what we came up with eventually was putting the ash, the sign of the cross on her hand. And she can tolerate that for a little bit and understands that um, having that bit of uncomfortability probably adds to the theological or faith experience. But she also knows that when she can't handle it anymore, she can go wash her hands. And then we extended that also um, to foot washing on Monday, Thursday. You can have your feet or your hands washed I think the big thing is something that I um, have already uh, alluded to, um, allow questions. When I've talked to adults who have left the Christian faith for Jewish community or who have left the Christian faith or any faith period, the number one thing that they say to me is, I was never allowed to ask questions. I was always told that this is just how it is, or I was given an answer that I had already been given and wasn't very satisfied with. So I just would like to remind us that oftentimes the most, the most faithful response is to just say, I don't know, let's learn together, or what do you think? At the end of the day, the end of this day, I think it goes, it goes just back to that real simple idea that we are each, whether you're autistic or not, we're each made uniquely, beautifully, and, and each person has different needs or wants. You can learn more about autism in particular, and that might help you interface, interface um, with an individual in a more healthy way. But I think in general, if we approach one another with the understanding that we don't understand what the other person has seen or gone through, then we forge closer connection and greater Christian community. And thank you very much for having me. All right, thank you, Anna. Uh, as is our tradition, uh, we'll use this time to move into breakout rooms. We'll uh, we'll send you off for about 15 minutes into groups of, let's see. We'll do two breakout rooms. That should give you an, enough of an opportunity to have some meaningful conversations. We'll see you all again in about 15 minutes. Hello, friends. Welcome back. All right. It looks like we have everyone back. So keeping the confidence of your small group companions, invite you to unmute and share what, what fruit came of your time together in the breakout rooms. Just going to be very honest and say that even though I wrote all of those questions, our group did not talk about them at all. <laughs> That's completely fair. Yes, just for transparency and to give them permission to talk in this space about what we did talk about. One thing I have curiosity about is um, how many people I have unintentionally like hurt or harmed mm -hmm. by not knowing what I didn't know. And just some curiosity about how to um, cultivate a space where I and we as a congregation don't bring harm. And so just a commitment to further learning. And also, um, I think it was JJ in our group talked about um, perhaps utilizing the tool of like, I noticed this. Mm -hmm. um, how can I 
what, you know, was there anything you'd like to share about that? Or how can I be supportive? Or, you know, so it's just trying to work on some language around how to have some conversations I need to have. And because we can do better. I can do, we can, yeah. So. Thank you, Bree. This is Christina. Uh, I think that what I learned is, you know, I was scared. I have a, I have a, a grandson who's autistic and um, I didn't always know what to say or do with him. And I think that in my group, I, I expressed that and uh, she gave me, you know, Anna gave me a few ideas of how to uh, talk to him more. But I always say, I love, I always told him I loved him. And he would say, I love you, grandma. So, but we didn't do a lot of talking because he doesn't talk much, but I didn't always feel I could talk to him or ask now I know I could ask some questions you know and it's not going to be offensive you know because I because I didn't understand artist artism so now I have a little bit more understanding so I can ask a little bit more questions and get to know him a little bit more you know so I'm I'm grateful for this uh presentation so thank you thank you <clears throat> This is always tricky with coaches who know how to be comfortable in silence. <laughs> yep. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> I'm curious. If, oh, Tammy, go ahead. Well, I, I was just going to say, I this wasn't in a talk. We didn't talk about this, but I was thinking, I've been thinking now about um, how to support families when there is the breakdown, the meltdown kind of dynamic. Um, I mean, I think the... Um, the J, the judge in me would go, oh, I wish they were better parents, um, you know, which is not, I, I know better than that now, of course, but that's, I think, a place where a lot of us might go to in the process. And I'm just wondering, as church community, uh, I know education would be a component of that, but, but how how to be supportive to those those parents who are struggling, because that too has got to be a really challenging place to be yeah absolutely thank you well, as our time together starts to draw towards a close i wonder if there's anyone who'd be willing to share what next most faithful step they have as a part of our time together today I, I'll, I'll quick speak and then I'll shut up. Um, my, <laughs> I'm leading a retreat next week at Spirit in the Desert on Boundless Compassion. And one of the sections is on marginalization. And we're going to be talking about race relations because that's one component that is in my wheelhouse. But alongside of that, I want to bring out all kinds of components that might be fair game for them to have conversations about, including now this opportunity to think about autism and and that that component of how we marginalize others. Awesome. That's great. I sit on the board of the Evangelical Lutheran Education Association, which serves our, our early childhood centers and schools. And I would love to have you speak to them. I think that all of our teachers and directors would benefit greatly from hearing everything you said today. I just felt like it was so helpful and uh, I look forward to reaching out to you. And I thank you for, uh, thank you for your work. Yeah, thank you. I love to do that. Love to. I'm going to go on social media and celebrate Pastor Gordy and connect and say hello and do all those awesome things and celebrate this conversation. Thanks, JJ. It was such a gift to see kind and open faces in this room. Um, and that's not my next faithful step. My next faithful step is I have a whole list of resources that I've been compiling that um, I'm going to make sure ends up um, distributed to y'all so that you have a, a list of things you can read or do or learn more about. Fantastic. And we'll make sure that that gets connected with the recording of today's yes. event. 
And if people wanted to be able to to follow up with you, assuming you're open to that, what's a good way to be in touch with you? You know, the very best way is um, to text me. I know that sounds crazy, but it's just true. Um, so I'll give you my phone number if you would like it. It is area code 757-373-7300. All right, thank you. Oh, I think you're muted, Rosita. It's 757-373-5582. All right. That's going to draw our time together towards a close. I want to invite you uh, to come back and join us again next week uh, when we have a presenter by the name of, uh, ah, yes, David Hively. <laughs> I'll be back in the chair, uh, but this time uh, in the presenter chair to talk about what kind of community of faith we might want to be in the year leading up to the 2024 elections. I have some things mm -hmm. to say about what it means to, to be a community of faith that holds space for folks of different political persuasions and how we might uh, work together. But for now, I want you to know that you are seen, you are valued, you are loved, and that you can keep changing the world one coaching conversation at a time. Be well, friends. Have a good week. Thank you. Thank you.